question and then in the last uh, uh, 15 minutes we would uh, try to be interactive and take some questions. Meanwhile, if the audience has uh, some questions, they can uh, type it on the uh, on the chat uh, platform and then I'll answer the questions one by one in the end. I will try to make it uh, more practical rather than being uh, more of a uh, didactic talk. It, I would try, try to make some practical tips and tips, uh, tips and tricks out of it. So. Uh, it will benefit, uh, and especially uh, in taking examination and in the viva thing. So, uh, Sharif, is the uh, presentation uh, on the full screen or? No, not not uh, yet, sir. Just click on the preview button. Play, maybe. Yes, sir. play. Yeah, yeah. Now we can see full screen. Thank you. Uh, so um, we are talking extrophy epispadias complex. Uh, it's called a complex because it's not a single system disease. Uh, uh, if uh, one thinks that it's, it involves only the bladder, uh, urinary bladder, or it in, involves only the phallus, then uh, then uh, believe me, we are wrong. Because even uh, this is very important point because uh, when uh, we go on to our later slides and we see that. Uh, 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 we have to deal with the skeletal system or we have to deal with the perineal system or we have to deal with the other genital organs, then uh, you will think, you will understand that this is not a single organ defect, but a complete multiple system pathology. And it belongs to the category of most severe form of lower abdominal malformations. And uh, uh, as we all know, uh, I would uh, go on to the next slide that uh, its most mildest form is an epispadias. Then uh, later on in the uh, today we will discuss about various forms of epispadias and how they are many. Uh, but the mildest form of an extrophy epispadia uh, complex is this uh, simple case of epispadias. And as we uh, proceed down the line, then we uh, get to see these uh, uh, this extrophy bladder thing. And this is uh, one of uh, again uh, a more harder or difficult form to deal uh, besides the epispadias, it has this extrophy bladder, the bladder plate is exposed and we will describe it later and see how to deal with it uh, during the uh, short practical points uh, during the viva preparation or things like that. So this is the extrophy epispadias com uh, complex as it's seen now. And uh, even and on the lower end of the screen, uh, besides the bladder plate, you can see a large swelling uh, on the lower part of the abdomen on the right inguinal area. And this is, a, of course, uh, a big uh, inguinal hernia. And this is always a part of the extrophia base pedias complex. And they have to be uh, dealt with uh, when you are uh, doing uh, the repair of the bladder or you are doing the repair of the bladder along with the epispadias repair. At at that time, at the first stage, whatever it may be, or it's a single stage, then you have to deal with these hernias. And in neonatal period, uh, they are easy to deal with. They are uh, posterior hernias, and, but later on, uh, they may become more and more difficult as they become more and more enlarged. Another picture of uh, this uh, famous but difficult to deal extrophy epispadias complex in a male child. And as you can see that the bladder plate is protruding where with, uh, especially in this uh, picture, you can see the two uh, ureteric orifices which have, which are coming out or protruding out of the bladder plate. And uh, of course they appear like this in most of the cases. Sometimes they don't, they are not that much prominent. Sometimes it's difficult to see them even in under anesthesia. So there are different various ways of uh, presentation of them. Uh, very important point is uh, uh, the low set umbilical uh, cord or umbilical point at this moment. And uh, sometimes it's totally absent. Uh, you uh, one uh, can easily say that uh, in extra, most of the extrophy bladders, there is no umbilical uh, umbilicus. And uh, sometimes this is a small hump or a small prominent area at the upper part of the bladder plate, which you can say a low set umbilical cord or umbilicus. And, uh, Again, uh, a female extrophy, and uh, of course, extrophy bladder is uh, also present in female children, though, although 
uh, in male it's more common but uh, again a female can present with extrophy bladder uh, in my opinion in practical uh, to add a practical point of it that it's more easier uh, to deal it in female uh, child rather than in male child because episphedias uh, male episphedias is itself in itself a entity a difficult entity to deal with and uh, uh, rather than a female episphedias so in a female child it's much easier to manage than in a male child and uh, again the prominent ureters you can see on uh, on the lower end of the bladder plate and of course the more fierce form or the most difficult form is the cloacal extrophy uh, rather uh, when you when you add this cloacal extrophy into the extrophy episphedias complex it uh, somehow uh, is sub, uh, this all subset is a, a form known as a cloacal malformation because this is one of the presentations of cloacal malformations the cloacal extrophy thing and as you can see in this uh, figure when you compare this figure with the previous slides I have shown, you can easily see uh, um, by the um, word uh, fierce uh, are used because uh, there's a big omphaloceal on top of the bladder plate. Then in this entity, the bladder, uh, there are two hemi bladders. The bladders are always split. There is a, uh, again, the, uh, it is maybe associated with the epispedias being divided into two phalluses hemi uh, one on each side. Then there is uh, always ileum uh, or uh, cecum protruding into in between the hemi bladders. So of course it's a different, it's a very difficult sort of a thing, and it has its uh, implications uh, throughout the life of the child. I mean a cloacal extrophy child uh, may be a patient for all its or her life. You see there is imperfect NS as well, and of course aspects of epispedias if a female case. So it's a it's the more dangerous one, but uh, but um, uh, thanks uh, to Allah that it's one of also the one of the rarest form, and uh, so we we don't have much of lots of cases of clinical extrophy, but lots of cases of uh, uh, extrophy bladder and epispedias. So uh, coming to some sort of a theory thing in this case, so bladder extrophies are about. Uh, one in 50,000 live births and male to female ratio, as I also ma mentioned previously, that males are more uh, common than female. Three is to one is the ratio. Then again, primary epispedias is one in one lakh and 20,000 and five to one male to female ratio. And plecal extrophy uh, is one in three lakhs, which is the more severe form. And of course, uh, it has less uh, numbers around. Uh, before going on to the treatment and management aspects, it would be very important to see uh, some, just to revise some uh, sort of embryology for this defect. And then there are uh, two or three major theories that how crextrophy takes place. I mean, you can always read them through your uh, Langman's or uh, basic embryology books, but just a reminder and so that we can then focus on to the treatment aspect because um, this is very important that how it is formed so as you know uh, uh, well know about the cloaca and uh, we are talking about the cloacal anomalies and cloacal malformations in this case so cloaca is a very important uh, organ at this stage of development in the extrophy epispedias complex and cloaca, uh, it's also the part of the hindgut later on and it's uh, cloaca is later divided into a urogenital uh, sinus uh, which is which is anteriorly and the hindgut part posteriorly and urorectal uh, urorectal septum uh, divides the cloaca into the posterior hindgut segment and the anterior hindgut segment so if you can well appreciate on the figure that uh, uh, the urorectal septum is gradually from day 24 to 26 is coming down and it will meet the uh, end point or the skin point and divide the two cavities completely. So uh, even on, on okay, uh, we'll see this figure also, the cloaca is very prominent and the membrane, which is uh, on the outside aspect of cloaca is called the cloacal membrane. And again, it will further differentiate when this cavity is divided by the urorectal septum into an anterior part, which is the urogenital sinus and a posterior part, which is the anorectal canal. And uh, the, uh, the part of the cloacal 
epithelial membrane which covers the urogenital sinus is always is, is called the uh, urogenital membrane and the part posteriorly it is called the anal membrane and uh, of course these membranes will gradually rupture this is the normal anatomy so they will gradually rupture and this will end up into uh, urethral meatus and the anal opening again a very uh, a very nice drawing the best of all of them then you can again see uh, uh, the membrane in the first figure which is uh, the a figure and we can see and uh, this cloacal membrane is very important i about cloacal membrane because uh, the theories uh, nearly uh, uh, nearly uh, end up on the cloacal membrane and how it's ruptured and uh, then uh, the extrophy takes place so as you can see that the cloacal membrane in the b figure is also seen the urorectal uh, membrane is coming down into the cloaca it will in the c figure it has already divided it into the uh, bladder part anteriorly and the hind gut posteriorly and the cloacal membrane is still there and then in the d figure we can see that it has divided into uh, the cloacal membrane is divided into anterior urogenital membrane and a posterior anal membrane and uh, ultimately uh, when the anal membrane will rupture, it will lead into an anal opening. If it doesn't rupture, it will be an perforate anus. And uh, similarly, urogenital membrane will rupture and uh, it will uh, open up into a uh, uh, metal opening. So now, uh, what are the uh, important that uh, have taken place over the years and still work is going on? No one is still certain that how uh, extrophy episcopidias complex takes place but some theories are logical and uh, they should be mentioned here for example uh, bursting theory uh, it says there's interior rupture of the embryonic bladder if you remember the figure uh, just we uh, saw in the previous slide that the anterior rupture of the embryonic bladder is caused by the abnormal retention of fluid so he the, uh, this was one of the oldest theories and they say that the bladder had uh, lots of uh, fluid or urine in it and it's abnormal retention that it couldn't come out of the uh, uh, normal uh, passageway so the it caused some pressure on the cloacal membrane and it ruptured but this theory of course only will tell about the extrophy uh, bladder it won't uh, explain how the uh, musculoskeletal or the genital anomaly will take place so this theory is no more popular these days and but uh, of course part of the uh, thing and then uh, i would go on to uh, this uh, last part which is the ambrose and o'brien uh, et al uh, theory which said that there was a premature rupture of the cloacal membrane and this was at that point that when cloaca uh, was uh, together or it was in the early phase of its development that the cloacal membrane ruptured but again this theory would only explain and maybe the cloacal extrophy sort of a thing because whenever there is a pre premature rupture of the cloacal membrane and it hasn't still formed the hind gut and the uh, urogenital sinus it will only lead to that part it would only explain that part of the uh, embryological phase uh, what Th Tomella did was uh, this was the start of the new era of theories for to explain extrophy episcopidias and what Tomella did that he created a herniated defect in the lower abdominal wall of a chick embryo by incising the cloacal membrane with a laser. So uh, this was on purpose built extrophy episcopidias, and he showed that when uh, when the cloacal membrane was burst with a uh, or incised with a laser, the abdominal wall uh, had a herniated defect, and of course the resulting chicks which were born after this uh, laser thing they all had extrophy episcopidias complex. And uh, this is how uh, the cloacal membrane again came into picture, but then there were more things to be added on later. For example, uh, this is the uh, famous Marshall and Newt theory. And uh, what they did was they, they placed some plastic grafts uh, into the area of cloacal membrane, primordia. I mean, uh, in 52 R6, this was again done on a chick embryo and uh, uh, they inserted a plastic graft in, into the area of cloacal membrane, which acted as a wedge and did not allow the cloacal membrane to fully mature. And uh, 
by this me uh, by, by what, what i mean by not becoming fully mature is that uh, this theory led down to the uh, this uh, this experiment laid the foundation for the theory that uh, the mesoderm could not migrate between the ectoderm and the endoderm because there is the urogenital sinus was lined by the endoderm thing and outside there was the ectoderm but in between the mesoderm has to come in to form the musculature and skeleton and uh, because they they inserted uh, plastic grafts in between the two layers uh, this let Uh, to the uh, to not to the uh, so the mesoderm could not extend into this uh, area where the plastic graft was placed and so there was no development of the muscle musculature and the bony uh, skeleton and this of course explained uh, that the extrophia pisvidia is complex along with the musculoskeletal and genital defects and this laid the foundation of the present uh, this is the most this was the most latest theory which has been brought into light and this led the uh, this led to some explanation of the whole syndrome sort of a thing with the muscular skeletal and genital defects and all those things so now coming to some practical points of uh, uh, how they these cases usually present so, so there is this visible bladder plate below a low set umbilical cord and then uh, of course the mucosa in, and this case uh, usually doesn't come in the yy so it's all uh, i mean it's very difficult in the part two examination to put these cases into examination system because uh, uh, usually they are children and uh, when you get hold of adult patient then they can present in the short cases but uh, of course children uh, are not good patients in this this sort of scenario so but, but you one should know how to explain so on seeing these cases uh, you can divide easily divided into two parts that there is a bladder plate then you have to explain the bladder plate and then there is the epispedias and you have to explain the epispedias so as you can easily see the bladder plate is visible it is polypoidal it is inflamed more in most of the cases it does uh, look like this and uh, then the shaft of the phallus is short of course uh, short we'll see in uh, while why is it short the, so it is short and stubby and uh, it is by stubby you means it's thick and uh, it's broad and it's short in size so these are the three different sorts of words you can use for a epispadiac phallus and uh, of course it's wide open it's split open and uh, there's uh, always a shiny good robust uh, urethral plate on top of it and so therefore urethral reconstruction in these cases is never a problem in a, we'll see later in epispedias repair that yeah, urethral reconstruction in these cases is uh, never a big task and uh, there's good and uh, very rarely a fistula is formed because of this beautiful robust plate but of course the bladder on top it doesn't look good and uh, when you further uh, proceed in uh, presentation of these patients and you do a x ray pelvis you are that the pelvic ring is ventrally wide open even uh, if you try to feel the pubic bones uh, with your two thumbs it's not possible uh, because of this tissue mass and even if you can do there there is a wide uh, uh, symphysial diastasis uh, with abnormal pelvic floor so always there is a space between the two pubic uh, bones and usually uh, it's about this, uh, the distance between the two bones is about 2.5 cm uh, which is on an average in most of the cases and uh, i will come back to this size when we are talking about the osteostomy things later so inguinal hernias are present in up to 80% of boys i mentioned before that and 15% of girls and usually the testes are descended and uh, scrotum is well formed Uh, so most sometimes in neonatal and in early uh, childhood the testes may be retractile but most of the times we can find them or we can bring them down into the scrotum they remain there so uh, after the main anatomical uh, defect which you have seen the previous picture uh, the cosmetic appearance and all those things uh, the next important point is uh, how the anorectal and pelvic floor defects are there so of course perineum in short and broad whenever you look uh, at these boys pre from perineum uh, you you can see it's short and broad and usually uh, the ns is situated directly behind the urogenital uh, diaphragm 
So it's more anteriorly placed. And why is it more anteriorly placed? Because you can see on the right side of the uh, slide on the diagram, uh, the bones, sacrum, and you can see in normal, the anal opening is right in the middle or more towards posteriorly because the levator and eye muscles on its both sides, uh, they come from behind and they get attached to the pubic bones. But when the pubic bones are wide open, as you can see in the lower figure, the levator and eye muscles are not in an oblique direction, but rather they are in a transverse direction. And of course, most of their part, which should be uh, nearly equal on uh, in the normal subjects in this case, 68% is located posterior to the anus in an extrophy patient versus 52% in normal. As you can see in the figure yourself that it's more transverse rather than oblique, and this pushes the anus more anteriorly. And, and also, this is a very important point because it, it also, uh, also is mentioned because this levator nine muscle and puborectalis muscle, they, they form the anatomy of the pelvic floor. So uh, when the distortion uh, is evident in the case of pubic diastasis and they are not oblique and more transverse, it means that their control over the urethral sphincter as well as on the anal sphincter is not uh, up to the mark as in the normal subjects. So this is a very important point when you when you reconstruct the bladder neck in a case of extrophy uh, bladder uh, or uh, in a case of severe epispadias or penopubic epispadias. In those cases, uh, this uh, thing has to be keep, kept in mind that there is not a, a good pelvic floor to support uh, the bladder neck later on. And this leads to various degrees of anal incontinence and of course, rectal prolapse may happen sometimes. Coming on to the you know, skeletal defects, yeah, well, you can see in the top figure that the pelvic bones are uh, wide open. There is a, uh, this is called a pelvic uh, diastasis or a pubic diastasis, and uh, symphysis pubis is not formed, rather, it's wide apart. And of course, uh, along with this, uh, uh, there is abdominal external rotation of interior and posterior effects of the pelvis, then there is 30% sh shortening of the pubic remia. Pubic remia are very important in closing the pelvis. And then uh, due to this, there is retroversion of the acetabulum. And all these, uh, what's the clinical implication or that most of these children, when you see them, uh, if, if they present later, in, if even if they are repaired, they come to you in clinics in, later in life, you can see them that they walk with a waddling gait. What is a waddling gait? Uh, it's uh, a gate by which a duck walks. So if, have, if some of, of uh, you have seen a duck walking uh, beside the stream, you can easily imagine that the, it, uh, there is some external rotation of the lower limbs of the feet and uh, they, they pick up one foot, put it down, pick up next. So it's sort of a waddling gait. And um, similarly, these children, although uh, when they grow up, it becomes more and more better because of the growth of the other muscles or the, uh, you can say that other group of muscles overtake the deficient muscles and somehow it's compensated, but in early childhood or uh, maybe five, six, seven, eight years, they walk with the waddling gait. You can easily notice that. So in next uh, would be the genital defects and uh, I mean the embryology of how uh, the anatomy, how it uh, reflects in the uh, main extrophy epispadias complex is that the, the corporal length is very important. So we are talking about uh, uh, corpora cavernosa, of course. And uh, as you can see in the above diagram, which is uh, stated normal, you can see that the posterior corpora, corpora are attached with the pubic bones and the posterior corporal corpora are short and they are not so much thick. As well, uh, uh, along with that, anterior corpora are, are lengthy, they are long, and uh, of course, uh, this forms a normal phallus. And when you see the lower figure, you can easily see what I mean when there is pubic diastasis, uh, and the corpora are overcom overcompensated uh, by overcompensated Uh, due to so yeah 
Okay, so the posterior uh, uh, aspect of the corpora, as you can see, as comparing to the above diagram, they are uh, they are more thicker. They are uh, and the anterior part, anterior corporal length is bit much bit shorter. And this is the reason uh, which can, when you can uh, when you transfer it to the daily clinical presentation, you can easily see why spadiac phallus is shorter and more stubbier and thicker. And this is the reason because of the corporal length. And of course, then there is one more aspect. When you see the patient uh, clinically, you can easily see that the uh, phallus is, uh, has a slight dorsal cordy. And this is also to do, due to this fact that they are shorter and uh, because of the pubic diastasis, uh, when it's pulled, they, they, uh, the phallus it just rises up and points towards the sky. So they, are, uh, they have a slight dorsal cordy. Otherwise, prostate is usually normal in these cases. It uh, produces good fluid and uh, innervation is uh, normal. They have erection and uh, we will see in the later part of, uh, in, of the presentation that how they uh, get along uh, with uh, uh, their sexual activity and uh, fertility issues. So um, the, uh, the picture of a female uh, trophy and of course, uh, although and there is no um, um, epispadias like in a male phallus, but still a female epispadias is present here. And we can, uh, some of the features, I will later again show you some slides, but some of the features are a bifid pelvis. And then, of course, labia, mons pubis, and clitoris, they're all are divergent. Specifically, clitoris uh, is bifid. And uh, as even on this picture, you can see that the orifice is stenotic and it's displaced more it interiorly. And uh, when uh, you can examine uh, if uh, there, it's a older child or a female presenting uh, with uh, later on in life with a repaired extrophy, then you can see that uh, you can also the vaginoscopy and then it's observed that the uterus enters the vagina more superiorly and the cervix is in the anterior vaginal wall. Uh, rather than superior part, it's in the anterior vaginal wall. So these are some of the defects. Of course, they also have a poor, a poorly formed uh, urogenitor diaphragm, greater layers into uh, incontinence and prolapse issues. And uh, of course, whenever it's possible, when one is repairing a, a, a extrophy female in later part of the life, it's always uh, good to suture or anchor the uterus uh, with a sort of a with the sacrum, which is a sacropexy sort of a thing, or colpopox, colpopexy can be done uh, so that later in life it, it doesn't uh, prolapse out. This is a good diagram of a female epispadias, and uh, one must be very uh, knowledgeable whenever examining a child which usually presents with the dribbling of urine. Uh, it, they usually present with dribbling of urine, which it may be continental. Continence, but for a child uh, with dripping of urine, one must examine the genitalia, and this is a very important point. And it can be, as you can see on the top figure, that it can be easily missed if uh, uh, one doesn't know about female epispadias, and you and one doesn't uh, pull open uh, the uh, with softly pull open the uh, labia, and uh, then you can easily see on, uh, the picture will just come out like this in the lower diagram, which you can see. So there's a lot of difference between the upper and lower diagram, but it's the same patient. So one can easily miss if the, the diagnosis of female epispadias with dribbling is not in mind. So as you can see, there's this biofit uh, clitoral, uh, clitoris along with the divergent labia and all. And then there is a patchless uh, urethral opening. And sometimes this patchless urethral opening is more distal and sometimes it just opens into the bladder neck and you have then one while repairing you have to uh, uh, look after uh, a good length of urethra so that to make the child more continent so these are some of the things uh, which you can see uh, coming on to the male epispadia as i mentioned earlier that uh, there are three variants and these three diagrams very well uh, uh, you can imagine that there is a glandular epispadias, which, which usually is covered by the skin up till the glands. And uh, when, once uh, skin is retractable, then only can you uh, uh, label it or first 
time it is diagnosed when the skin is retracted a glandular episode so sometimes they go unnoticed uh, through their early childhood period and later present to you with a glandular epispedias and then uh, there is this penile epispedias which uh, uh, is somehow uh, mid penile uh, epispedias and uh, there is skin up till the penile and uh, then there is a groove there is a big cleft in which the urethral plate is wide open and it's uh, dilated and you have to repair it uh, later up till the mid penile and sometimes the third variant uh, is always uh, the more harder to deal with and it, it is usually up till the bladder neck there is the urethral uh, plate is wide open up till the bladder neck so one has to deal it deal with it to close it and these are the three variants and sometimes the penile epispedias is the more trickier one because when you retract the skin uh, the cleft may be up to the bladder neck. So penile epispedias may actually be a penopubic epispedias rather the, than a penile epispedias. So another picture of this uh, uh, male epispedias variant and uh, it also appears to be a penopubic one with a deep cleft between the glands of deep, uh, good robust urethral plate which needs to be repaired. And I've already mentioned uh, about the clerical extrophy and it's beyond the topic uh, to be discussed in this one hour period. So I will just lay, leave it go. And you just have the idea of the main characteristics which are already mentioned about the clerical extrophy thing. And uh, now starting with coming up to the management and the, of course the management starts uh, at right at the time uh, in the embryological period when uh, these days it's more antenatally diagnosed and uh, about uh, as uh, mentioned it, there are about 40 percent of cases are antenatally diagnosed these days at 18 weeks of gestation and uh, of course uh, not in our uh, society or setup but uh, more often in developed countries in europe and america they give uh, if it's diagnosed earlier in pregnancy uh, they give them a chance of uh, termination of pregnancy and so that the child doesn't have to suffer all his or her life and uh, but uh, that's uh, one of the aspects of this dangerous disease that uh, but some of the features as i have mentioned uh, that are usually uh, able to diagnose it antenatally is its inability to visualize urine in the fetal bladder there's a low set umbilical cord a short white penis and a bulging bladder plate presenting as a low abdominal mass if some of these features are present, then it can be easily diagnosed prenatally. And of course, whenever it's diagnosed, even if it's prenatally or postnatally, there has to be a meeting between the parents and the pediatric urologist. And uh, of course, various aspects of the disease are always uh, um, uh, discussed there, uh, along with some reassurance uh, of the parents because it's not a life-threatening condition it can be managed throughout the life and uh, of course uh, this is one of our common observation most of the pediatric urologists agree that these uh, these are uh, the most cutest and beautiful children around uh, whenever they are sitting in a group you can easily uh, see that a extrophy child is one of the more cutest one uh, somehow god has uh, given them uh, this uh, other part to overcompensate for the other thing. Always a reassurance is better thing. And then, then you have to discuss with them all the sorts of uh, repair tips and tricks because uh, these days, lots of emphasis is on the stage repairs. And of course, you have to give them and teach them that what a stage repair is, when is the extrophy to be closed, when is the spitias to be repaired, when is the bladder in the construction, as I will talk in the later slides. But this is uh, uh, session that we have to be uh, sit with them and deal with them so that because it's a high sort of thing and we need to know and what sort of uh, follow-ups what clients uh, you have to uh, have to go with because uh, to make the child more throughout your life so pre-surgical counseling with experts is no one can do such a big surgery or such a stage wise surgery without them, and it's a very important aspect. What well, when one look they treat them, treat and
يا شريف Okay, so uh, I should keep uh, continuing. So I think Sharif is not but you fully. So okay, okay. So I should. I think there is something wrong with your voice, uh, network actually. Ni, uh, aapko awaz nahi aari, Sharif? Uh, ab aari, sir. Now it's okay. Aari, it's correct. Wo, mere khalai connection disconnect ho gaya tha, to dobara rejoin kiya. So, okay. of course, defining the objects of treatment is very important and uh, one of the major uh, obvious handicap is the visible deformity. Uh, there is uh, this... Uh, you can say a cosmetic disaster uh, rather than uh, a small visible deformity because uh, a ch child with uh, exposed extrophy epispadias, so it needs to be corrected. And of course, this is one of the aspects of the treatment uh, options and management. And then there is this another uh, second point you have to deal with that these children are uh, from the word go, they are urinary incontinent. So of course, they uh, they need to be continent and the parents also expect this uh, from their treatment objective that the child uh, in the initial part of the childhood may be in pampers but after a while after the school going age or, or at that time he or she should be continent and uh, you can see when they are about eight or nine years or ten years old male or female child when they present later in life and they are incontinent and when then after treatment uh, or after surgical management, they become continent. You can see the smile on their faces, the comfort uh, levels that they gain after becoming continent. So these, all these things have to be kept in mind uh, and because uh, and this, is, uh, the this is the object of treatment in these cases. And of course, uh, last but not the least, but maybe the most important point that at any time of treatment, uh, you, one has to be uh, sure that the upper tract upper tract is uh, preserved because uh, good kidneys uh, are the only thing they have from birth and, and they have you have one has to preserve the uh, renal function so it doesn't uh, they don't get uh, uh, dis disturbed the renal function doesn't get disturbed in later part of the treatment uh, uh, procedures so this is one of the important Okay, so this is uh, some sort of a neonatal management that usually we take in uh, most recommended guidelines uh, in most of the good centers uh, in where uh, these uh, uh, extrophy centers in which extrophy bladders are repaired. They do that at 48 to 72 hours of age. This is, the, uh, this is still a recommended thing and, uh, and ex except that in a, in uh, a few centers, they have their own protocols of dealing uh, extrophy bladder, but in most of the centers in Europe and America, they try to do that in very, in at the earlier age, maybe even before 24 hours of age. So uh, till then, uh, when the surgery is done, uh, it should be, there is, it is very important that the bladder surface irrigated with sterile saline. And of course, it has to be covered with a plastic wrap uh, this is the ideal form of uh, covering it, the plastic wrap. Otherwise, you can uh, take a cotton uh, piece and uh, soak it in a normal saline and cover it. Or uh, most, most often, what we do is we tell the parents to take a malmal, uh, which is a very uh, fine form of cotton. And then it has to be soaked and wrapped uh, along with other prophylaxis. Uh, one, if, if the patient has to be repaired early, earlier in life in the first few hours or first few days, then vitamin K, K and fungal prophylaxis has to be given. So these are some of the basic general examination and baseline investigations along with ultrasound and X-ray abdomen for pelvic uh, diastasis, which has to be done. The treatment components uh, are uh, 
these are some of the important treatment uh, components, including extrophy closure, of course, one has to close them. With or without osteotomy, it's a, uh, it's a very debatable thing. It's a very case to case uh, uh, sort of dealing thing. And uh, I will uh, come to the osteotomy po point and then we will discuss about it. And then of course, uh, after extrophy closure, with or without osteotomy, epipedias repair has to be done along with uh, later part, bladder neck reconstruction, then there are burking agents. And of course, if uh, everything else or the incontinence mechanism fails after bladder neck reconstruction or bulking agents, then of course there has to be a continent diversion along with a CIC. And what are uh, the basic procedures we will see later. So these are, this is just a sort of a protocol which has to be followed in, it may be followed in any unit. I mean, every uh, extra fee unit has its own protocol. So maybe closure at birth and then followed uh, later by epispadias repair and bladder neck reconstruction, maybe at the same time uh, or uh, at uh, before one year of age, it's only epispadias repair uh, or uh, it may be a Kelly repair with the epispadias repair and bladder neck reconstruction. So there are different sorts of options which we will discuss just now. And uh, of course, uh, later on, uh, I, will, I have again mentioned continent diversion and CIC uh, as a last resort if everything else fails. So some of the basic surgical options, as you can see in this slide, is a stage repair, uh, which uh, with again with may, with or without osteotomy and different sorts of repairs and different sorts of stage protocols are followed. I will mention one or two later uh, in this presentation. Then there is a complete uh, complete repair in the first sitting. Uh, it, and uh, even in the infant age, like a Mitchell repair or something like that. Uh, historically, uterosigmoid blasphemy was done, but because of its uh, uh, high incontinent rates and also risks of cancer later on, so it's, it's nearly abandoned these days, it's not done. And of course, augmentation cystoplasty with a continent catheterizable uh, channel. It's uh, one of the last resorts. So what is uh, a modern reconstruction of bladder extrophy? So I've already mentioned that the primary objective is uh, uh, not only cosmetic repair, but also the functional closure uh, of uh, uh, bladder extrophy. And all uh, modern reconstruction is sort of a stage repair. I've just mentioned in the previous slide, then when you close the bladder extrophy and turn it into a a complete epispedias, then later, maybe at six months of age, maybe after needed, if needed, a testosterone stimulation injection, or maybe even up to three testosterone stimulation injections, and then epispedias repair can be done with a good robust palace. And at uh, and the patient himself or to be motivated into a voiding program sort of a thing because bladder neck repairs may repair doesn't mean at all that the child is going to be continent. But you have to uh, train again for the first time in life maybe, you have to train him or her into uh, holding the urine. It's sort of a potty training at a later age, maybe four years, five years before a school going or something. upper tract because this is the more most vulnerable period at which the upper tract can be damaged and uh, if patients are not compliant if the child is not motivated then this may lead into a big disaster so this is uh, when we are talking about a one day or two day or three day old child so these are some of the tips that uh, those children in which the bladder is about the size of a thumb of a surgeon uh, it, it depends, uh, uh, of course, it depends on the size of the surgeon as well. So it's, uh, it's about 5 ml capacity. Uh, when, if one thinks that the bladder is of a 5 ml capacity, then only uh, can uh, you close the bladder. If the bladder is small, it's, it's not robust. It's not elastic, it's not uh, uh, pliable. So one shouldn't bother doing a bladder closure because it will fail and it will fail badly. And then of course, uh, reclosures have to be done or it may damage the upper tract as well. So one has to be very careful when you're selecting patients for earlier closure. And of course, osteotomies have their part. Why are osteotomies done? Uh, osteotomies are done to bring the pubic diastasis uh, 
to more approximate levels so that the pubic bones are in a more approximate position because when uh, pubic bones rotate and come together they will bring the muscle they will bring they will bring the more approximate position the ball will close better dumb ball will little close better so it's more of uh, uh, a loosening sort of a thing for other procedures to take shape so when uh, uh, for example when you talk about a uh, bladder extrophy failure for a, example a wound resins uh, uh, and complete opening up again of the bladder in a failed procedure one has to be one has to look that whether osteotomy was done or not because osteotomy was one thing results in quantity of continence and uh, of uh, uh, bones are together in, as in osteotomies so one has to be very careful about that so there are advantages of course the advantages of osteotomies and uh, bladder closure after 72 hours uh, of birth is one of the indication why not before 72 hours because it, it happens that the uh, bones the pelvic bones are more lax and more pliable and malleable and they can be brought together with stitches as well. So no need to do uh, osteotomy when the pelvic bones can closed, uh, uh, can be closed without osteotomy. And if the pelvic bone, uh, bones are more than four centimeter apart, then there is more need of osteotomy. So these are the various types of osteotomies. Won't go into the detail of some reconstructive model because in the upper left side of uh, the, uh, the upper left side diagram shows that this is the case of pubic diastasis with more than four centimeter uh, defect and in the lower you can see that after rotating the pubic bones into the normal position with the help of osteotomies and we can see the form now visible this is one of uh, monitoring uh, when one is doing the osteotomy on the table, the CMs, X-rays are used, and uh, when you operate, that means that uh, the osteotomies have worked fine. And this is what I meant. Uh, you can easily see on the left side, uh, white open pubic bones, white diastasis, and in the lower side, the external fixation is applied, and you can easily see the obturator foramen. So this is a uh, practical point to remember when one is doing the osteotomies. So this is the sort of appearance that you uh, feel you get. Uh, uh, these pictures are post uh, osteotomy appearance, of course, and the external fixators are applied. And of course, external fixators can be uh, helpful even in the later parts uh, of the uh, of the procedure repair. Even after one month, you can keep on uh, tightening the screws so to bring the osteotomy uh, bones or the pubic bones more closer. And this is one of the steps uh, which has to be seen or taken care by a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. He looks after it. So, and uh, look at the plaster. It's called a frog plaster, and there are various ways of immobilization in. Uh, uh, extrophy repairs and this is one of the immobilization techniques is the frog plaster which is applied with some internal rotation of the feet and uh, and everything is in a spica sort of a thing so the patient doesn't move and uh, again some of the things which has to be kept in mind in these sorts of repairs primary barrack projects epidural is very helpful nowadays uh, we even keep the epidural catheters for about 72 hours at our place and uh, then broad spectrum antibiotics of course and uh, uretric uh, catheters are inserted nowadays we are not putting in uretric splints we put small six french or eight french pcns in the uretric orifice up to the kidney because pcn tubes have a upper self-retaining pigtail end and they don't come out easily on their own and plus uh, uh, of the material is so inert they cause less and less infection infections are uh, minimal at, uh, because of them. So these are some of the tips that we use here. And uh, these diagrams you can easily see from your books, so don't need to follow them, but the picture is very important, the lower right hand picture. You can see that a, a cleft or a groove is uh, made around the extrophy bladder. And the, the, because the main point is that the bladder plate should be mobilized 
from all its ends, from all aspects, and it should be free from the surrounding fibrotic tissue or the muscles or the because it won't go back and it go back the and so it's very important that the bladder neck area and the bladder itself should be free of the surrounding tissue so that it can fall back deep into the pelvis and then you can easily repair the muscles and uh, other tissue on top of them and uh, results in episcopalia. So these are some of the other figures. You can see the bladder is well mobilized. You can see that it's free from the surrounding tissue and it's ready to go back into the uh, abdominal wall along with abdominal wall closure. So postoperatively, all tubes are left on free drainage. It depends on two weeks, three weeks, maybe sometimes four weeks. And uh, key one important point, if you if you say that I give you one important point of management after primary closure, a uh, good free drainage is very important. Good free drainage uh, is. Not moving the legs because they are in strong. And this is again So again, the connection was lost, but I'm back here now. So, I will just skip some slides because I have now only maybe four minutes left. And then, uh, so I will go, this, uh, these figures you will see in the book also, so it doesn't uh, need some explanation. Of course, Kentville Densley or modified Kentville Densley repair is uh, one of the best forms still used all over the world. And then uh, the second option these days, this is these are the figures of uh, the Kentville Densley procedure. And uh, you have to dissect the corporal bodies, you have to dissect the urethral plate. Uh, urethral plate is not detached from the glands, uh, otherwise it's all free from the corpora and urethral reconstruction is done and then uh, the corpora are brought uh, onto the dorsal because this is the primary defect that the ventral surface thing, uh, urethral plate is on the dorsal side. So you have to take it back to the ventral side and bring the corpora onto the dorsum and do a cavernoso cavernoscopy uh, on top of them. So these are the final shapes which you can uh, see attained by these uh, by this modified cantwell Rensley repair and uh, uh, somewhat restored towards the normal aspects. So then there's the, this complete Mitchell's uh, disassembly technique uh, used in some uh, units. And these days, Kelly repair is more and more becoming uh, famous because of this radical soft tissue mobilization. It's called the RTSM, radical soft tissue mobilization, and it's becoming more and more popular. Uh, and uh, the main uh, issue is that it's uh, the soft tissue around the bladder neck and the uh, bladder is, is radically mobilized along up till the pudendal vessels and pudendal medical is also got freed. And uh, in this way, it's more easier to, uh, to lengthen the corpora because uh, they are also mobilized with this radical soft tissue and, and the 
length uh, in the Kelly repair, the length of uh, the phallus is now now more and more uh, longer than in the previous repairs we used to do. I would just come on to some important points now because the time is very short now. So bladder neck reconstruction uh, is done only. Uh, bladder neck reconstruction is done only when there is an early response of uh, epispedias repair. Uh, bladder is closed, epispedias is repaired, and now the bladder has a volume of more than 100 ml at one to two years of age, or maybe three years of age, and then you can go on a motivated family for a bladder neck reconstruction. And uh, usually, uh, this is this is, uh, these are the practical points which one can follow in bladder neck reconstruction or to assess the bladder. And uh, because a bladder less than 30 ml at one to two years age uh, needs a serious discussion. And I mean, it's not possible. Then there is one way of assessment is a cystoscopy and bladder volume evaluation and a GA, and uh, which is done maybe yearly to sort out timing of reconstruction. And then there is measurement of total nighttime volume with pamper weighing and first morning wadded volume, which gives a good idea of the capacity needed to prevent upper tract dilatation. Repairing a 100 ml bladder and getting a nighttime volume of 300 ml doesn't make sense. It will blow up the upper tract as, as soon as possible. It would be a disaster. So it's better to get a good evaluation of the bladder before going on to the bladder neck reconstruction. So there are various ways. And one of the ones we use is a modified young bees bladder neck reconstruction. You can easily read it from your books. I would just go on. And uh, of course, uh, uh, what are the different aspects would you need uh, before uh, the what would be the uh, rather the question would be what would be the long term outcomes would you like these patients to have so number one is incontinence and of course uh, there are various uh, sorts of methods of repair there are various uh, uh, grading uh, charts of uh, bladder of uh, incontinence but uh, uh, and every unit, every department has his or her own uh, way of measuring incontinence. But uh, one of the chart is mentioned here. And as you can see, uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3 in different way. And for uh, one procedure, for Kelly procedure, for example, there is a 72% daytime continence with some minor problems. And uh, But the problem is that at the night time, even in the Kelly procedure, which has a good uh, radical soft tissue mobilization, only 25% remain dry at night. And this is, uh, this is uh, the figure of uh, one of the major centers of the world which has given these figures. So you can imagine that uh, what sort of incontinence still remain. And then these are some of other long-term issues. For example, there are cosmetic and functional outcomes. They come even at 40 years of age or 45 years of age uh, in uh, come that the cosmesis is not important so uh, there has to be some sort of a mechanism as the cosmesis or you have to give reassurance to the patients that uh, this is the best one can do so there are long-term sorts of things and then there is risk of malignancy which is four percent at 30 years of follow-up there is risk of renal dysfunction uh, at 25 percent and then 10 percent present with renal, uh, renal insufficiency so what about male sexual functions and fertility? So we, uh, most of the male patients, they experience normal libido and 90% of patients can achieve erections. This is a good sign. You can, uh, you have to counsel this to the patients, but of course, then there are some issues associated with also. And uh, then if, if, for example, if there is severe persistent cordy, then for penetration, some corrective surgery has to be done. Then majority can experience orgasm, but have slow or retrograde ejaculation, which again is a cause of uh, infertility in these cases. And fertility is significantly reduced because destruction of the ejaculatory ducts during blood and neck surgery. So the potential to achieve paternity is as low as 5%. This has to be told at the first sitting of counseling because they are worried about this thing and you have to tell the parents about the low chances of fertility. He would have in his uh, future life. And for females, the, the situation is not so bleak and uh, things are a bit better because for there is a uh, percentage of fertility in females and, uh, and because uh, there is a good percentage about that. But the pregnancy may be complicated by uh, vaginal prolapse and sometimes uh, for example, if someone has done a augmentation cystoplasty and 
uh, and uh, a patient has to uh, uh, has to be operated upon for C section, then uh, it's better to have a urologist around, and it's better that someone who does these sorts of procedures to be around at the time of C section because a normal delivery is usually not possible. So I would like to thank you all for patient listening and uh, thank you so much. G. Sharif. जी शरीफ आप हैं जी शरीफ जी शरीफ आवाज आ रही यस सर ये तो लेक्चर तो खत्म हो गया आई थिंक आप जैसे इफ देयर एनी क्वेश्चंस पार्टिसिपेंट्स को है तो आई थिंक जवेरिया कमर हैज रेज हर हैंड ओके हाउ टू मैनेज हाउ टू मैनेज यस Assalamualaikum sir. Waalaikumsalam ji. I have to ask uh, this question about what about uh, dehiscence after bladder extrophy repair. So if bladder dehiscence occurs after extrophy repair, how should we manage that dehiscence? If it occurs early, then what if it, it occurs late? Then how are we going to manage? So, so again, uh, we have to look into the causes of dehiscence. So let's see for the immediate thing. Uh, usually it's wound infection usually there is leakage of urine along because when you place in these uh, stents or pcn tube or anything there is seepage of urine there is seepage of urine into the uh, into the subcutaneous tissue plane or the muscular plane and then this seepage results in infection of the skin and uh, subcutaneous tissue that's the primary cause the urine is the primary cause that's why i mentioned that there should be free drainage and you have to ensure uh, and in my in my department over here what we do is that uh, it's the duty of the resident who looks after the patient that he has to he has to uh, document himself or herself the hourly output in the bags because it's it cannot be such a big surgery can be left on uh, on persons who, uh, on uh, just Uh, after uh, mentioning urine for uh, recording urine for uh, later than 4 hours or 6 hours so it has to be done one hourly and if if there is empty, if the bag is empty after one hour or the tube is not getting some urine then it has to flush with a 2 cc or 3 c 3 ml normal saline this is one of the primary things that we do for initial drainage and then of course the urethral catheter the suprapubic pubic if they it's there they all have to be on the free drainage and you need to flush them with 2 or 3 cc every few hours so initial 24 to 70 hours two hours are very important usually uh, the uh, usually the foundation for dehiscence is laid in these three earlier three days otherwise when some when wound the infection is uh, already seen then it's better to open the wound as soon as possible you cannot put on keep on putting bandages on on top of the wound to suppress the secretions so you have to open them up as soon as possible so it it doesn't end up into a big dehiscence and of course later on if uh, you may then osteotomies if not done previously they have to be done because this osteotomies will help help in a reclosure So nearly all the reclosures at our unit are done with osteotomies. 
सर वन मोर थिंग प्लीज थैंक यू सो मच वन मोर थिंग अगर अगर ऐसा हो जाए फॉर एग्जांपल अगर डिहेसेंस हो जाती है देन व्हाट इज द वे आउट हम उसमें डाइवर्जन करेंगे तो किस टाइप की करेंगे और देयर इज समथिंग अबाउट फैशनिंग द ब्लैडर इनटू अ ट्यूब एंड लेन लेटर रिकंस्ट्रक्शन वो समझ में नहीं आ रहा था एंड वन मोर थिंग इफ वी लूज द कैथेटर्स अर्लियर ऑन लाइक विद इन फाइव सिक्स डेज वी लूज द कैथेटर्स तो देन व्हाट वी आर गोइंग टू डू I mean, if you if you lose lose the catheters, that uh, means that you haven't uh, done the basic thing right, because uh, they are secured at least two or three places inside the body before they come out of the body, and then they are secured on the skin. So the basic thing is to secure them. If you lose them, uh, I mean, there is fifty percent chance of uh, getting dehiscence if you, if you lose them earlier. Uh, the thing that you mentioned of a diversion. Usually, uh, I remember one or two cases in which we had to do PCNs to divert the urine. It, it's it uh, it's not uh, usually when the dehiscence happens, uh, whether you divert urine or not, it doesn't help much because dehiscence is the is the next step of a infection. So you have to control the infection. But once this infection has already begun, it's very difficult to be controlled, and usually it opens up. so it uh, so that's why what, what i meant that open up a part of it so that the whole wound doesn't open up mm-hmm. so for just a small part of it so that that was the point to open up the wound so just to drain the pus or urine or something like that okay and then when will we do the uh, repair again once once it happens yeah, three months is the basic time and maybe maybe six three to six months thank you so much sir thank you so much जी शरीफ में डिस्कनेक्ट कर लूं कोई और अगर क्वेश्चन नहीं है तो यस सर आई थिंक अगर कोई क्वेश्चन नहीं है तो थैंक यू वेरी मच वेलकम सर वेलकम थैंक यू टू यू एंड योर टीम एज़ वेल थैंक यू